Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Talking Kotlin. Uh, what you probably didn't see was how annoyed Hadi was that I just announced I was going to take us into the episode. So, Hadi, what do you have to say for yourself? Nothing. In fact, Seb, uh, some of the feedback we got from the previous recording was that we were talking too much about many things and not Kotlin. So let's cut straight to the chase and let's not discuss anything anymore at the beginning of each show and only talk about Kotlin. And with that, who's our guest today? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Uh, yeah, our guest uh, today is Ivan, who's the uh, who's a staff software engineer at Synthesized. Hi, Ivan. Welcome to the show. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. So unfortunately, uh, the weather segment, I suppose, or the tea segment or whatever else might have to wait until the end of the episode, or maybe we'll just have to cut it all together. Because, uh, you know, we'll... Or we'll maybe we'll... Give We'll insert it somewhere randomly so people really kind of like don't know when it's coming up. You know oh, what yeah. I'm saying? Like think, somewhere there's going to yeah, be that's... something about tea, green tea. So, uh, Ivan, welcome to the show. Where where are you uh, calling in from? Uh, Tallinn currently, but uh, I hope to move to London soon. Oh, nice. So you want to go from the EU to outside of the EU? Nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, so, what does Synthesize do? Uh, at Synthesize, we do uh, we uh, develop tools for developers. Uh, we develop uh, tools for synthesizing relational databases uh, and uh, transforming relational databases uh, for needs of testing, for needs of performance testing, for needs of experimentation, because. Uh, in many cases, in most cases, actually, we cannot use uh, production databases for this. Uh, so we can either synthesize it or transform it. Okay, so I think you're going to have to expand a little bit because I feel like synthesizing a database, that sounds uh, very science fiction to me, and I'm not really sure uh, what I should imagine uh, when you say that. So maybe you can give a little bit of insight about what that term actually means. Uh, well, actually, it means that usually you have your relational database and a schema, and you want to fill it up, pre-fill with some data for testing purposes. And uh, if you have production data, it can be sensitive data, or uh, there can be just no data at all if you're just uh, developing a greenfield project. Uh, so you can generate data to, to fill up your database, uh, taking into, into account all the constraints, all the relational constraints, all the data constraints, which is not an easy task, by the way. Uh, so we can do this. Or if you already have uh, your product production database, you can just take it and mask, just remove uh, all the sensitive data, replace it with something generated, with something random, or you can subset it if uh, your database is huge and for testing purposes you need only a tiny fraction of it. So uh, th these are the tasks that we uh, that we, we strive to address in our products. I guess the word synthesize comes from that aspect of it, like to produce something, whereas instead of music or chemically, you are doing it on data, so to speak, yeah. right? Okay. Now mm -hmm. it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so we're taking into account some statistical uh, distributions, uh, some, some properties of existing data, if we, have, uh, if we have them, or we can just set them and uh, generate. And all of this has has the goal of just making sure that your your test data is as close to what you would have in in a real life scenario uh, without necessarily relying on on the real data. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. All right. So all right. that uh, your production data won't leak to just to developers to some random people. Yes. And you mentioned relational. Is it only applicable to relational, or you do it for document databases and other types of storage uh, well we we would like to do this someday but now we we only do this for relational databases okay and so what kind of shape does the does your product actually take like is this a, a service that's running in the cloud is this a a library that you just kind of pull in um and then it use you use it locally like what does that look like 
Uh, well, actually, uh, actually, it's a, it's a command line tool, <laughs> and uh, yeah, currently not 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 many people I I, I think would like to upload uh, their sensitive data to to the cloud. So uh, yes, it's just uh, a command line tool written in Kotlin that we distribute uh, to our customers, and uh, it's uh, DSL based. So uh, we have uh, 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 the user has to provide configuration. Uh, about what what they want to do with their data. What, do they want to generate or subset them? Do, do they want to uh, use uh, specific generators for specific fields and so on and so forth? Uh, so uh, user provides uh, a configuration written in some DSL and uh, our tool uh, just connects to databases and uh, uh, does its job. All right. I think that's that's really cool. Um, I personally am a I'm a big fan of uh, having uh, the kind of command line tools with the with their kind of pluggability. But I am I am curious because obviously there's uh, there's a lot of languages out there, especially if you want to write like these uh, um, just kind of like scripts um, or these kind of things. What made you choose uh, Kotlin? And did, do, are you running like is is this a Kotlin JVM tool that you're shipping? Yes, so yeah, we we are shipping jar actually. We are shipping jar, uh, so uh, we tried to use uh, ahead of time compilation Grail VM, but we failed for now because I think we yes the uh, the project must be started from the very beginning, uh, targeted for ahead of time uh, these days. So, uh, but yeah, now now we are shipping just uh, just a jar. About the choice of the language, it was not my choice, actually. I just synthesized a year ago, and the uh, choice uh, has been, had been made by the time. And uh, frankly speaking, I was a bit skeptical at that point. <laughs> because, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I've been working for quite a long time uh, for the industry, so many <laughs> languages lot, uh, worked a lot for Java. And uh, I do realize that bringing in some fancy new technology always brings in some some troubles, uh, uh, some problems. And uh, a year ago, I thought that modern Java with Lombok maybe uh, can be a correct choice for any enterprise project. Now I completely changed my mind. <laughs> That's a spoiler. Uh, the year after, uh, you changed it towards what? Uh, okay, that was it. That, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, towards <laughs> Scotland, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned uh, Graal VM. Have you tried Kotlin native at all, or was was that not considered? Uh, no, it was not considered. Uh, we are using Spring uh, also uh, for parts of our project. So, it was just Graal VM and Spring Boot uh, plugins and something like this. Okay, so so what parts are you using Spring for? Is it to, like, is it the data access part with databases? No, no, it's uh, dependency injection part. That's the DI, DI part, actually. But the library itself is a command line tool um, that yeah. then populates databases, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, so it connects to, uh, yeah, via JDBC. And okay. yeah, uh, we are using Juke to access some data, but we are not relying on Juke on manipulation of data because we are just doing custom SQL queries. I see. Yeah, and yeah, why why JVM? Because of JDBC. Because JDBC is a very stable uh, technology to uh, to connect to relational databases yeah. with lots of drivers available. So generally, I think it's clear. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Um, so. You said that you changed your mind from kind of saying modern Java is enough to uh, now Kotlin is is the great thing. So do you want to actually walk us through what made you change your mind? A number of things, actually. Uh, well, as I mentioned, our product is DSL-centric, right? So we provide some DSL domain-specific language for our customers, and it's currently YAML. And uh, the first thing that I wanted to do for this project when I arrived there as an engineer, I uh, uh, wanted to rewrite it so that we used a single specification for, for the DSL. Because we're also uh, trying to, uh, to create some user interface for this. And it was like 
uh, back end part they are writing their DTOs and front end part they are writing their DTOs uh, separately. Then some people are trying to uh, document all the stuff and everything is out of sync. And also we need a JSON schema for our YAML and it's also out of sync. So I proposed let's have a single uh, let's have a single specification for the DSL and let's go generate uh, Kotlin TypeScript documentation JSON schema out of it. And at this moment, uh, they told me it's 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 impossible because the our classes. Uh, our entities, they do have some, uh, already do have some methods, some logic inside them. And the first thing that I realized that, that is good about Kotlin is extension methods. Surprisingly, uh, you can code generate like just fields in your classes and then uh, they are code generated, right? And all the custom logic, you can put it to extension methods. And after I did it, uh, the rest of the project, they they even didn't need to to rewrite it so it just came smoothly and it was just wow for me because uh, uh, before that I, I thought why why do I need extension methods it, it's a mess because either I'm putting some some logic inside my class or outside of my class why, why do I need extension method and here they they worked perfect perfectly together with code generation so this this was the first uh, the first example so you're kind of keeping uh, your, your DTOs as as like literally just uh, data like holders, and then but you can still use the calling convention as you would have if they were just regular like business objects. Um, but those parts you you can keep outside of your out of your code gen. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Right. Some some yeah some some logic about like produce. Uh, Produce uh, some property out of uh, property A and property B, concatenate. I don't know some some simple things. Of course, we have uh, uh, just uh, other layer with, with uh, more logic inside. But uh, historically, they had this simple simple code that that still cannot be specified by uh, DSL specification, and it can be put uh, to to extension methods. And uh, it turned out to be not 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 a bad uh, pattern. So we continue to uh, uh, to specify our DS, uh, our DTOs in a spec, and then add something on top of it via extension methods. So uh, I think there's a lot of juicy stuff that we can talk about here because we're talking about code generation, essentially all this meta programming, and I'm very curious to dive into that in a moment. Uh, but just to understand this, so what what is actually the canonical representation? How what like what format is your is your spec? Is it the Kotlin code? Is it a I don't know a JSON file? Like what are, what are you looking at there? It's Open API spec actually. <laughs> so I just took I just took the thing that I used more often. It's Open API spec. Of course, it has its peculiarities and. Uh, uh, its limitations, but also it has extension properties. Like you can add X something to uh, to every place of your uh, Open API spec, and then you can interpret this X property uh, as you wish uh, during during the processing. So it's extensible. But let me, let's let me take a step back. Uh, I'm an end user that wants to use your tool, right? Um, and I have a database. Tell me what I'm meant to do. I, I think it's important to kind of give folks the context of, you know, how your tool is used to then dive into a little bit like what the DSL aspect of it is, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, yes, of course. Uh, so you're writing a YAML file, <laughs> actually. Uh, so you're writing YAML file, you're writing, a, you're pro, uh, and uh, you're producing a couple of, uh, a couple of configs. Uh, first, you you need, of course, you need uh, JDBC connection URLs to input database to output database, and then you need this YAML. And uh, this YAML currently uh, you can create using uh, 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 using code suggestions from your IDE because you have JSON schema for for, for it. And uh, this is uh, heavily documented and. Uh, uh, the idea is uh, uh, built. Uh, of course, it's built around uh, zero configuration idea because with some basic YAML, with just short 
YAML configuration, uh, by default, uh, our uh, tool will produce you uh, data taking just some default decisions based just on your database schema. If, if it has a numeric field, it will just choose random number for this field if you uh, don't ask it to do something else. Okay, and so the YAML file there basically is only to override some default conventions, essentially. Uh, yes. Right. Approximately, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, it's... and then from that YAML file, you are then generating what? From that YAML file, we are not generating anything. We deserialize it into our, some internal structure, and uh, we are using it uh, just to build the execution plan and then we uh, just execute this plan uh, because we need to insert data in incorrect order if we have foreign key relations in databases. So we need a, an execution plan. So we need to uh, collect data from source database. Uh, we need to uh, copy uh, structure, database structure, if we don't already have uh, it uh, pre-filled in, in, in target database. And then we need the execution plan to generate or mask or transform uh, the data and fill it into uh, to the target database. Uh, this is how it works. Okay, so then I'm I'm a little bit lost here because where does the DSL aspect of this come in? Uh, the DSL aspect is that we have YAML DSL facing user, and <laughs> you you might uh, uh, be wondering why not Kotlin DSL. <laughs> Well, I was kind of thinking you're using a Kotlin DSL, yes. Yes, <laughs> so, we, are yeah. we are using Kotlin DSL internally, actually. Right. And, uh, and, and yes, uh, yeah, uh, maybe we will be using YAML DSL for, for users as well. But you mean let's Kotlin discuss DSL? Uh, yes, Kotlin DSL, Kotlin DSL for users okay. as well. Yes, of course, of course, of course. But yeah, uh, that's maybe a topic for discussion. <laughs> Okay, and so what is the usage of the internal DSL for Kotlin? Where are you using that? Okay, if we are talking about uh, uh, internal DSL internally in our application, uh, we have a set of rules, the default rules that uh, I mentioned before, uh, right? So if, well, the, the most simple one is if this is an integer field, non-nullable and no other constraints on this field, then choose random number generator uh, in, in positive, I don't know, in positive range, for example. So that's some default. If we have a number of, uh, uh, a number of conditions, then we apply this and these rules. And for this, of course, we need some metaprogramming. And that was another, and, and uh, this was another story. The first one was about extension methods. The second was about internal DSLs that, uh, we at some point we had messy code with lots of ifs and so on and so forth so we tried to refactor it somehow so it turned out that this meta programming in in dsl uh, works best because somewhere inside our code we have some like natural language like file uh, in case of this and this and this do this in case of this and this do this uh, so that we can uh, verified, for example, for consistency. If, we, if you have lots of rules, uh, it's easy to make them inconsistent so that uh, they will, I don't know, interfere with each other, with each other or some rule will never, uh, will never work because it, it's uh, just covered by some other rules before that, that are executed before it. And uh, this logical consistency can be checked separately using some specific tests. Uh, so uh, this is, yes, this is extremely powerful technique and uh, yeah, we're using it. And so is this DSL something that you've written from scratch by hand or does this also, is this combined with your whole code generation story? Uh, yeah, code generation story is about mm, uh, just another aspect. We have about 20, 20 so-called generators like your know, Gaussian generator, random text generator, random person uh, generator, random address generator, uh, whatever you can imagine. So it, it, about 20 of them. 
all of them have some specific uh, parameters, also lots of parameters. Uh, so that uh, when you configure them using, using YAML, uh, you need uh, this YAML to stick to some schema and you need this YAML to be deserialized to some DTOs, to some, uh, to some model, right? So what we, uh, uh, what we uh, actually specify is, uh, is this YAML, is this YAML, this, D, uh, this uh, JSON schema and these DTOs. And of course, uh, these rules, they involve uh, like use this generator with these specific parameters if these conditions are met, if this set of conditions are met. So of course, it's just uh, part of this uh, part of uh, the classes, parts of the verbs that are used in this DCL. They are code generated, of course, and something is written by hand. Um, but one thing that uh, I think might be uh, quite interesting here is that you said you're using Open API as kind of the canonical representation mm -hmm. um, for what you do. Um, but t but so typically, I guess people mainly use Open API to specify like their their RESTful API endpoints and communicating with the server. And it doesn't right. sound like that's what what you're doing in 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 your case. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no, because we also uh, have uh, uh, we also are building UI for this tool. So we also try to build uh, uh, what's called projectional editor for for the thing. So instead of writing YAML, you you just can click it through, uh, and. Uh, Again, at some point, uh, you need to transform this, uh, the parameters of these generators, right? And the set, uh, the set of properties is the same on front end and on back end. So uh, we are using, uh, so we are using standard Open API uh, code gen to generate uh, some uh, TypeScript stuff from from this, and uh, our custom generators to generate documentation. Because our uh, documentation, I mean, not your uh, standard Swagger documentation, but uh, custom documentation which, which is specific to, to our tool. Uh, and uh, this uh, JSON schema uh, to help people write this YAML and uh, uh, classes for Kotlin. Okay. But in case of the, the CLI tool, it's just kind of like using the, um, the open API generated classes just internally without doing any like not using it as a as a communication structure in that sense yes of course but the the, the stuff we are doing is not limited to this uh, just uh, cli tool we need documentation we need up-to-date documentation and it's good to have documentation just uh, uh, let's put cl as close to to the source as you can so if you have uh, some definition of uh, properties of some generator and you have description uh, property in open API spec that's saying this this standard deviation defines this and this and this minimum this maximum defines this and this and then we we are able to compile just fine html document for this as well as a kotlin class that works somewhere inside somewhere inside our CLI tool, as well as some TypeScript interface that will work for UI folks. Okay, so you're you're really just choosing Open API as the agnostic way, uh, and then you're gonna be generating right. whatever you need, right. not- Right, uh, and uh, yeah, and I tell you why, because we have a nice uh, parser for it. Open API parser, it's a Java library, and uh, you can do great things with it. You can write your own tools around the open API parser. We could invent our own just DS, meta DSL for this, but it, of course it would have taken some time uh, to, to build it, to build some parser, to build some tooling around it. Uh, yes. And, and you, open API is extendable also. You mentioned you're you also doing code generation. How, how are you doing that? Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting question uh, because everybody uh, who's familiar with Open API they know Open API Code Gen uh, Library, Code Gen Tool, and it's a great tool because it can generate in I don't know dozens of languages, uh, uh, but it has some problems uh, because 
uh, well, if you want to generate code for Java, for example, as far as I know, it tries to generate a whole project for you with Maven, <laughs> with PomXML, with the implementation, with README, and something like this. Uh, 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 read me too, huh? <laughs> yeah. <read me. laughs> All you need is just DTO and a set of uh, and a set of interfaces. And uh, the problem with Open API Code Gen is that they're using mustache templates to generate, and this is the only the only way if you want your product to be polyglot, language agnostic. But the problem with mustache templates is that they are good for markup languages like HTML, XML, JSON, uh, ASCII doctor, but they they work poorly for programming languages. Because when you insert some, I don't know, some name inside your code, you need to import it in the beginning of your module. And this is where <laughs> mustache templates work extremely poor. And uh, uh, this is why uh, open API code gen templates, they are overcomplicated. I know lots of programmers, lots of engineers are working on them and improving them. But if you want to make some non-trivial change to standard templates in open API code gen, good luck for you. I tried. <laughs> uh, trivial changes, they are okay, but non-trivial, they're not, not so good. So uh, for Java and Kotlin, uh, I decided to go just other way because we have specific specific tools for code generations. Uh, these are uh, Poet libraries, Java Poet and Kotlin Poet. And together with uh, uh, Open API Parser, Open API Parser is a Java library which is used by Open API Code Gen. So this is just your standard official parser for Open API. Uh, and together with this, it's very easy to generate whatever you want in Java or in Kotlin. Uh, so, so this is it. I uh, have produced this, uh, an open source library called Hurdy Gurdy, like a musical instrument. Uh, so you can search for it on Maven. But actually, uh, actually, it's opinionated. I think every it's better for you to to just to take these two tools. Uh, I mean, Open API parser and Poet library, and you can easily uh, just in in a couple of minutes create some proof of concept for, that works for you. So uh, I actually just have your uh, your dependency file here for uh, for Hurdy Gurdy open. Uh, so the library that you said it's the it's Swagger parser, is that right? Yeah, Swagger or... parser, not Open API. Yeah, Swagger parser. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Just just making sure. And then actually, I'm I'm curious. We we might be diving a little too deeply in here, but just just kind of walk me through uh, what that API like looks like? Am I just going to get back like a, an abstract syntax tree of my open API spec? Or is there like, how, how would you then go from, from taking that, like from, for doing this transformation? Well, this Swagger parser, it uh, pr uh, produces a nice object model for, for open API spec for you. So it has endpoints or the parameters of the endpoints. Uh, but what we need the most for, for DSL, for, for, for our part is of course, this, uh, what's it called? I don't remember this, DTOs, these classes. So uh, this number of classes and you have like types, nullability, again, uh, which not present in, in Java, but it is present in Kotlin and it is present in Open API. So uh, types, nullabilities, uh, what else? Descriptions and uh, some meta information, and so on and so forth. And also, uh, it supports some complex stuff like uh, polymorphism, like you have some basic basic type and some subtypes via all of and any of. And uh, yes, this is all supported in uh, in Kotlin. Uh, we need to to generate uh, Kotlin classes in such a way that it can be serialized and deserialized via Jackson. But uh, Jackson has uh, all the needed magic for this. Via, via annotation, so yeah. So would you would you say that if uh, if people are looking into generating their their own like Kotlin source files at uh, like for their own projects, 
Kotlin poet should be like the the first stop where they go for is yes, that a library course. that you would recommend yes yeah. Yeah, yes of course yes of course because you just write uh, fluently write what you what you want to output like use this class use this method uh, ca call it and so on and so forth and it will manage all the imports for you it will manage all the code formatting for you so it's like i don't know api uh, like lightweight ide maybe so I, I would de define it like this because it's really, really advanced library, of course. And if they want to, uh, if they want to generate a code from open API spec, then try Herdy Gurdy, of course. It's, it's a lightweight library. It will produce you uh, some interfaces, some DTOs, but it, if it doesn't fit, you can easily just modify it or write your own implementation. All right. Um, so I actually have a, a follow-up question uh, on on this because, again, as I'm kind of browsing along here, um, I'm noticing that you are using uh, Maven for Hurdy Gurdy. Uh, you're not using Gradle. Do you, do you wanna <laughs> do you wanna talk about that for a moment? Because I feel like uh, a lot of people. Yeah, I, I told you. Yeah. The, the I told you at the beginning that uh, I'm your old-fashioned practical and skeptical engineer. <laughs> or otherwise known as, I don't do Android development, so why the hell should I use Gradle? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people in the world that I, don't I, use Gradle. Uh, I had some just bad encounters with Gradle before with uh, Groovy DSL, but uh, now when uh, with Kotlin DSL, it's, it's absolutely okay. Coming coming back to Kotlin and coming to, back to DSLs because of uh, type ty type safety, uh, it's uh, just impossible to write just broken script uh, in uh, Kotlin DSL for Gradle, so it works well. In in synthesized, we use Gradle with Kotlin DSL, of course. <laughs> Uh, and in Herdy Gordy, just for historical reasons, because uh, yeah, it was it has been used in other projects written in Java. So why not Maven? I really have to ask, I mean, I know it's not relevant to Kotlin or Maven or Gradle, but why call it hurdy-gurdy? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I tend to, to, to name my open source uh, projects uh, by names of musical instruments because I love music. And it's like tools, you have to, to learn them and uh, they can do something for you. So it's hurdy-gurdy. Another my open source project is called Chilesta. Also put lot of lots of effort into it, and uh, it's another it's another musical instrument. And you know how to play the hurdy-gurdy? No, I am not a musician at all. Okay. So I I cannot play anything. I'm a listener. I'm not a musician. I unfortunately, okay. <laughs> I see. So in regards to the tool, it's a command line tool. You also said that you are providing some kind of web interface. Is there any kind of uh, plugin for IDEs for it as well? For IDEs, no, no, but we are producing a uh, JSON schema so that uh, JSON schema can be used in VS Code and the IntelliJ IDEA so, so that uh, people can easily, uh, can easily write uh, YAML configuration. And by the way, from, um, from our experience, VS Code with, uh, uh, with uh, YAML plugin works better. For uh, for complex uh, JSON schemas that involve uh, polymorphism, when uh, the available properties they depend on the properties that you already written just before, it it shows you the correct the correct choice the correct suggestions. So this this is all you need for uh, for IDE support when you are doing YAML. And this, this leads us maybe to, to another topic, why uh, YAML versus uh, Kotlin DSL for, uh, for end users. Yes, definitely. I mean, okay, before you even say anything, I kind of understand why not. Like, you know, YAML, if it's just defining specific configurations, it feels like going beyond that is an overkill. But yes, do, do tell. Why not YAML? <laughs> oh, why not? Oh, why not? Uh, why, why not Kotlin, not Kotlin DSL? Ah, yeah. why not Kotlin? Why not Kotlin? Uh, yes, because YAML is ubiquitous. Everybody knows YAML. You have lots of tools for YAML. Uh, just uh, lots of IDEs. Any any your favorite uh, text editor will do for YAML, of course. Uh, while if you are involving just Kotlin, you need 
you need IntelliJ IDEA. So uh, maybe this is the primary uh, the primary issue here. Hmm. I mean, yeah, sure, but like uh, maybe I would see more as there is no need for a Kotlin DSL here that that YAML doesn't provide, right? Because my understanding is that folks that are using your tool don't need any kind of uh, complexity in, in setup or anything that cannot be expressed with a series of name value pairs. Or is there? I mean, is your YAML file any more complex than that? I don't think so. Yes, uh, I don't think so. We don't need some uh, we don't need some imperative code there. But why not? At some point, because we already had issues like people want to insert some some scripts inside their code, like transformation scripts, like mapping of values. Yeah, and before and, you know it, you'll end up in the same position as Gradle. So be careful mm -hmm. going down that route. <laughs> So how do people currently specify their transformations? Uh, just uh, just by configuring just by configuring uh, this YAML, and oh. uh, of course, uh, yeah, they they are not able to to do some specific stuff. So I'm actually curious on a on a more kind of general purpose uh, perspective, since you are building uh, like a CLI tool. Uh, how how that experience is is overall with Kotlin? Uh, how you feel, for example, I don't know the libraries for for parsing arguments or for uh, providing a nice human readable output in the in the terminal are just kind of if you want to give us a bit of an overview of that, if you'd like. Well, actually, I don't even remember the name of the library that we use for parsing command line line or arguments. It just works. <laughs> As for <laughs> <laughs> for for output, we are using standard uh, again standard uh, Java uh, uh, standard Java logging, and uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty standard and actually not very advanced because uh, the uh, the product is intended to be used by technical uh, technical people. I'm curious as a I mean obviously use Java poet Kotlin poet from Square. Have you tried mosaic at all from jake wharton that mosaic allows first, you it's the first time when i hear about it so it's uh it? it's basically uh a tool that allows you to use compose to build uh command line output you know uis in with with the command line i mean not with the command line with compose for tools that target command line for mosaic. command line I tools <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Nice. <laughs> so I know that, uh, I mean, I was in contact many years ago with Imperial College London, mm -hmm. that uh, they were uh, converting their Java courses to be teaching folks in Kotlin, but they do it as a, as a, at a second year. They don't do it in the first year. The first year, the first programming language they teach is none other than Haskell, which resolves the question of what would happen if we were taught Haskell first at university and not Java? And there you what go. What happens? <laughs> 300 people graduate every year from that university. At that scale, not much. I think my, my first language at university was C. <laughs> Yeah. So, but uh, th th that didn't make me a C programmer at all. <laughs> I don't know C. <laughs> <laughs> so coming back to the uh, to the to the variance part, I think a lot of people, when they think about that or the their approach to to like variance in 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 Kotlin generics is, if my code goes red, uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna press Alt Enter and then. Uh, IntelliJ might suggest me to maybe add an in modifier or an out modifier, and then all of a sudden, like things work. So, what's do, do you have uh, a a more intuitive way uh, for people to actually understand this this topic, so that they don't just have to rely on well, maybe it works if I jiggle the modifiers a little bit? Uh, you see, 
a Kotlin language has a trap, uh, actually, uh, because uh, in Java uh, you tend to uh, to be locked with invariant type invariant types more often, uh, because if you don't have a method signature with question mark extends list of question mark extends something, uh, it will not work for you. So you will have to read something about PEX rule, right? Producer extends consumer super and uh, figure it out. In Kotlin. Uh, as soon as list is uh, covariant by definition, it works for you. So you can write, uh, I don't know, uh, a method which takes list of something as a parameter, list of list of person, list of employee, and, uh, and pass list of manager as, uh, as an argument, and it will magically work for you. And if you don't know uh, all the peculiarities, all the uh, peculiarities under type variance, you might think that if you invent your own class, parameterized class, and don't declare it as in or out as covariant or quadrivariant, it will magically work for you as well. And uh, this is actually, uh, yes, this is actually a trap. So it's easy in Kotlin, it's easier in Kotlin to, to use generics, but uh, you have to understand from the very beginning what, what you are doing. And of course, of course, uh, as usual, uh, 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 producer extends uh, uh, consumer super rule. You, you must you must remember it in Java. In Kotlin, it's easier. In is for input parameters. Out is for reading. Out for reading. In for writing. So uh, this is just a simpler mnemonic rule. Besides being more concise. So I, I think the the main reason why you can get away with kind of not knowing so much about variants is that it's it's a little of a specific topic in in regards to it kind of only affects you when you have your own uh, when you have your own generic types, which it most times yeah, if you're just yeah. writing an application, you 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 oftentimes get away with not doing that because you know you have built-in collection types uh, that already have everything you you need. Yes, 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 yes. I had previous experience at, at my previous uh, project uh, with uh, Kafka streams, for example, and uh, uh, I uh, contributed also to Kafka streams project. I participated in Kafka improvement proposals. And there I was taught how extremely difficult, just extremely difficult it is to create a good API, which will fit all the needs. And uh, especially if it's a parameterized, if it's a generic API. So uh, in Java, we have a lots of limitations. Uh, like in Java, uh, we uh, have this fluent APIs, this builder patterns like method, calling dot method, calling dot method. And if uh, these methods are generic, if they are parameterized, as you might know, Java uh, type inference stops, stops working there. So you will have to uh, specify, uh, explicitly specify type parameters uh, for these methods. Uh, in Kotlin, uh, you, you are using uh, this pattern uh, uh, rarely because you have apply and just, uh, just some, other, some other ways to apply something to, uh, to some, original pro, uh, some original object. Uh, so uh, it works better. And another, just another topic is this uh, declaration site variance. Uh, because for when we are talking about streaming libraries like Kafka streams or whatever, uh, stream is uh, in itself, it's a covariant class. So if we are working with a stream of uh, uh, employee, for example, stream of managers will do for us everywhere because streaming libraries, they are working with immutable objects they never modify this object. So uh, this is an example of a covariant class. In Java, you cannot do this. You cannot express this. And uh, this is why uh, developers of Kafka streams, they often meet limitations. Like imagine, uh, imagine a function that converts a stream of uh, employee to a stream of manager by promoting them or, or just by filtering out all the employees that are managers. The resulting stream still can be considered as a stream of employee, right? But you cannot, you cannot pass method reference to this method anywhere in Kafka Streams API. Because of this T parameter or K value parameter, 
is invariant and it requires for you to, for this function to be a function from stream of employers to a stream of employers and you cannot resolve it in java just anyhow because it it, it extremely poorly works with nested nested variants like question mark extends question mark extends it's just absolutely just doesn't make any sense in java in kotlin it's enough for you just to uh, just to declare a stream or sequence or whatever as a covariant type at declaration site and all uh, all your just functions that make sense as a transformation they will work as the method references for your api so uh, yeah, I think if uh, Kafka streams were written in Kotlin, <laughs> they would have had just uh, way, way more idiomatic API. So yeah, uh, Kotlin is great for building just idiomatic APIs, really. Nice. Well, on that note, we are out of time. We've got to wrap up. So uh, if folks want to learn more about your product, uh, where do they go? Uh, synthesize.io <laughs> synthesize.io and this is based on because you talk about command line tools so what what is the pricing model here uh i think it's better to to contact sales <laughs> i just don't have any okay folks any so what that means but... is that you gotta pay contact sales <laughs> means you gotta pay but but we have a, a quite functional free version as well okay we have uh, so you can try this out awesome Great. Brilliant. Okay. Well, Ivan, thanks a lot for coming on the show and uh, hope to uh, chat again, either in person or in London or in, I, I don't think I'm going to Estonia anytime soon. Are you going to Estonia anytime soon, Seb? I am not, no. There you go. I might be going to London again. Oh, there you go. Maybe London. Delightful. Well, uh, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. If you were missing the weather segment on this episode or there the is no segment, weather. Yeah, or it's, the it's sponsor segment. Anyway. Yeah, but I mean, then... The, the sponsors pulled out. They're like, you don't want to talk about the weather? You don't want to talk about tea? Why the hell should we even participate in this show? We lost <laughs> all our sponsors. They're like, we're not interested in Kotlin. Well, but if you do enjoy these, I don't know, more focused episodes, then I guess you can let us know. I have a feeling you wouldn't let us know anyway, uh, regardless of this request. Anyway, yeah, thanks for tuning in. This episode has been brought to you by Schneider. That extra eight two three pens. These are really was... good pens, by the way. Like really good. And I, I'm not getting paid for saying this. They're really, really good pens. Excellent. Well, on that note, thank you so much again for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.